Um, the slideshow is, um, I think it's about 45 minutes um, that I'll be um, showing you slides. And um, then we can have some time for questions at the end. I think, um, <laughs> given my abilities with the software, I'd be grateful if we tried to hold um, questions um, till the end. That's um, through a chat function um, that I believe is on the side of your screen. And I'm sure it might be helping me out with that um, too if we can. Um, but um, just wanted to let you know, so, so we'll do questions at the end. And um, also, the, my contact information will be um, visible at the end of this slideshow too. So if um, you just have questions for uh, me or for us, for all of us, um, please feel free to contact us after this, um, after this is over as well. Um, so our goals for this um, slideshow are that um, we want to, um, we know that editors are the gatekeepers to publications. And um, so we have a role in your um, careers and your career goals. And so um, what we're hoping to do in this, um, in this um, hour is to help you be successful with your publications with this journal. Um, and um, and uh, so that, that um, we're less of a roadblock to you. We're going to show you some of the um, big picture, um, um, a big picture look at the journal, our mission, our vision, our team. Um, and um, then we're going to get into the mechanics. And we're also going to try and um, answer some of the questions why when you're feeling very hassled as you're dealing with this uploading your manuscripts or, you know, somehow some part of the process that you, um, that you at least understand the reasoning behind some of the things that you're um, doing when you work with us. Um, a retired publisher, Mitch Allen, now has a, a blog um, that I think is called something like Scholarly Roadside Publishing, and he just published one about a week ago that talked about um, publishing as a social process, <laughs> and I think that's very much true, and that's something that will, um, will come through during this um, conversation we're having, or this one-way conversation that we're having, um, that um, it's very much about the people, um, and and um, kind of um, you know both you as the authors, us as the editors, and our peer reviewers, and and good communication is is part of a successful um, paper. Um, so with that, um, um, what we're going to talk about first is just to introduce you to the journal um, and. Um, our mission of the journal is that it's a um, quarterly, full-time, peer-reviewed digital journal that's published by the Society for American Archaeology, um, now in a publishing partnership with Cambridge University Press, um, to share creative solutions to the challenges of practice, in the practice of archaeology globally. And you'll hear pretty much all of these words <laughs> again and again throughout um, this um, slideshow. Um, the ways that we um, define practice um, in our editorial team is um, that we're looking for um, collaborative and interdisciplinary among the um, various um, sciences and humanities and the, all the ways that archaeology um, can interface with other disciplines. Um, the articles um, share research and some of the um, um, and some, and some of the things that we really want to highlight are our issues our, our practices that help to preserve places. Um, that work well with stakeholders and form collaboration, um, the, way, the various ways that we educate about archaeology to um, just many, many different kinds of audiences, and all the ways that archaeology can engage, and, um, and the ways that archaeology um, can therefore be relevant in, in so many um, ways. And those are the things that we want to um, show in this uh, journal. And um, this photo is from one of our um, editorial board members, and there's a great example of um, engagement. Um, so what are the benefits to you of publishing in advance? <laughs> um, one of the fantastic benefits um, of publishing in this journal is that a year ago, um, the SAA made this journal um, one of the benefits of, of membership, um, meaning that, that, you know, prior to that point where people had to choose among um, the journal, the journals, um, and including advances. Now it's, um, it's open to 7,000 plus people. Um, whatever the membership of the SAA is, that's your potential audience. And that's a huge audience. Um, if, as long as people are clicking the links and exploring. Um, um, another benefit, um, is that, um, at the beginning of this year, we, um, we started our new publishing partnership with Cambridge University Press. And they're in a position to further distribute the journal. Um, so in the past, this journal has primarily been available to SAA members. Um, and it hasn't been widely available through institutional libraries. I think now we can expect that to change as, as um, 
Cambridge is in a, is in a great position to um, market us together with the other SAA journals, American Antiquity and Latin American Antiquity. And so to get us um, um, many more readers in, in more countries. And so that, that's a pretty exciting um, benefit that we're going to start seeing um, in the future. Um, we have a global audience of practitioners and audiences. That's what we're aiming for. And that's um, um, our, my co-editor, Shore, is particularly on board. He's um, sitting there in Amsterdam, and he's um, um, very much helping us with the um, European um, audiences. And, um, and so, so that's definitely one of our missions and something that we want to grow. Um, and um, one thing that's um, different with this journal than um, the other SAA journals is that we aren't regionally restricted in our subject matter. Um, we now, with Cambridge, have open access options, which we'll talk about later. Um, we're very pragmatically oriented. You'll hear that um, talked about a lot um, in this in this slideshow. And um, we have the options to publish kind of creatively. It's not just uh, you don't just have to communicate with words. Um, um, you can communicate with, um, as this example from volume um, three illustrates, <laughs> you experiment with graphic novels formats um, with all kinds of technologies. There's, there's more digital capabilities um, with this kind of journal. And we'll talk about that again as well. Um, so I just wanted to introduce you to um, our editorial team. I have briefly introduced you to the editors at the beginning of this show. Um, so the editorial team, we have 17 members from around the world. And the reason I'm showing you this is that um, um, as I said, this is a social process. If you don't know one of the editors, and, but if you know some of these um, folks on the editorial board, um, definitely feel free to contact them. They represent the journal as well. Um, they're, they're very much in the loop about what we're working on and um, helping with the visions for the journal. So talk to them if you're not um, comfortable talking to us or, or use them as a, as a good starting point um, for figuring out if what you want to write is appropriate for the journal. And, and they're as available to help you out as, as we are. Um, and and their their names and all of our um, names are also on um, the various publication websites. So um, oh, but this does remind me that um, the SAA um, is recording this um, this um, PowerPoint and this um, recording. So um, hopefully this one of the points of the slides that I put together today is so that you have a resource um, in the future to come back to. So not all of these are the most beautiful um, graphics you're going to say you're going to see. Um, but they're here to kind of be a reference point so that you can come back at some point and say, oh, yeah, she talked to me about, um, you know, how to upload a manuscript, and you should be able to um, find that here as well. So I meant to say that earlier. Um, so the audience for the journal um, is, um, is, you know, you guys. <laughs> it's professors and it's students. Um, it's also, think about all the different ways that um, archaeologists practice. Um, it's the people who are working in cultural resource management. It's um, students. Um, it's people who um, work on cultural heritage projects. It's people in museums. It's people all over the world who are um, doing, you know, I think people in different countries might be practicing slightly differently. That's one thing we want to learn is, you know, how do the different, you know, heritage laws or heritage practices or just points of view um, come, um, how do they, we can all potentially learn from each other. And so that's, we want you to think about your audience. Um, in that way, as these very practical people who work in just every day, <laughs> um, what, what, what articles will help them in their everyday work? Um, their land managers, um, and their, you know, people working by the side of the road with heavy machinery. All of these people are the audiences. And I'm showing you the photo, showing you these photographs. And like I said, they'll be throughout the slideshow so that when you write your article, think of these people. These are the people that you're writing for is just, just sort of very on the ground, read your article, and then they go out and they do that. Like that's what you want is them to take your article and then go do what you're, you're suggesting they do um, so that then their work is as innovative as yours is. Um, the journal takes um, um, three different kinds of articles and we have a variety of setups that you've probably seen if you've been reading um, the journal with any regularity. Um, so I guess I'll talk from bigger to smaller. One thing is that we have um, usually, typically one issue per year since the second year of the journal is a theme issue that has about eight to 10 papers in it. Um, this is determined by a competition each August, and you should contact um, us well in advance um, to find out. Um, we have some guidance. Um, we have some guidance about um, um, how, to, how to put together a theme issue proposal. Um, so um, don't don't already have all the papers written and then contact us because um, that may not go well. 
because um, we plan to flow ahead. So um, anyway, um, contact us ahead of time, but theme issues are one thing we do. We also have started doing um, special sections, and we've done one of those in, um, I believe it was the May uh, 2016 issue, where um, Jeff Altschul, the former president of the SAA, put together some um, papers um, on um, land, landscape uh, management in um, United States archaeology. Um, again, this is um, something you'll want to contact us about ahead of time at, in, a, in a planning stage kind of way. The theme issues, we can only do one of those a year because it, um, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's great. These issues are, are um, really interesting, but they also create a little bit of a bottleneck for individual submissions in the flow of those. And so we can't do those all the time. Um, but special sessions, we could potentially do those a little more often. So if your um, ambitions are a little more modest, that's something that I think can work well for the journal. Um, and so just, just contact us about what you're thinking. Um, and then, um, the, you know, as I say, the bread and butter of the journal is individually submitted questions, uh, submitted papers, sorry. Um, and you don't have to contact um, us ahead of time unless you have a question about a particular topic or um, good fit. Um, so this is, the, um, this is exactly what the software is set up to do, is, is for your individual papers, and so that's very straightforward. Um, we have three kinds of articles within that, too. So um, one is the, probably the, ma the main type of article that most people are submitting is the research article. And this is an example of, um, you know, a very um, pragmatic um, type of research article that, that's a perfect fit for this journal. And um, the, the general format of these is that they are um, 6,000 words and spaces typed in the journal. And it's cited now that we're working with a publishing partner. Um, that's going to be very good at enforcing our space limits. So, so 6,000 words is what we're looking for. That includes your paper and your acknowledgement. Um, it doesn't include your references. Um, so, and these, the general format for these um, um, papers is that, you know, you identify a problem and you identify, you know, the innovations that you're going to present um, in it, and then you, um, um, then you create a, a case study and really demonstrate it and prove it. And that, that proof is part of the paper. You don't always have to write about a successful story. Um, sometimes your lack of success is, is, is interesting as well. Um, so um, it, um, anyway, keep, keep that in mind for the, um, for the research articles. This is um, all of this information about how to write a research article and a how-to article should be available um, online too. There's a little bit of description there. Um, the, um, the next type of article, and we can take um, more than one of these per issue as well, is um, the how-to series, which I believe was started in volume year three and has been um, um, a little bit erratic. Oh, um, so, so here's a, sorry about the technical. <laughs> um, so, so here's the how-to series. Um, these, um, these are about 3,500 words. Um, they tend to have very short bibliographies, but those, again, don't count. In this, and these are just um, um, sometimes these are things like like you can see in the title of this one, ten lessons. You know, it's just point one, point two, point three, um, and again, these these are meant to like print this out and go, you know, learn how to design a public program. Um, again, very practical. And I put this um, particular article up because I think this is my all-time favorite um, photo in the past year of the um, journal that we've been involved. <laughs> um, and the last kind of um, art article that we're taking now is um, digital reviews. And for this, we have the help of uh, Sarah Perry, our digital reviews editor. And these, we've only been doing one per issue. And she's put out some calls on her um, blog, and I think on Twitter, um, and has tried to get it out widely, um, that um, so, um, kind of advertising how these get done, what she's looking for. Um, definitely contact her, and um, you know you can find her in a, um, a variety of ways. As, as I said, she's on, on Twitter and all, but you, here's her email address. So she's the um, she's the gatekeeper for the digital reviews, and she's putting together a plan um, um, for, for these. Um, and uh, yeah, this is meant to um, you know explore our, our digital uh, universe and how increasingly that's those are the um, that's the information that we're working with and that we need to um, have some better understanding of these products and um, some critical review of some of these digital products. Um, all right, so those are the um, three different kinds of um, papers that we publish. And um, this is just to give you a sense of the theme issues that we've had um, to date. Um, and one of the great things, especially for a young journal like this one, is that 
um, publishing theme issues allows us to kind of change the course of the stream in terms of what's published in the journal. So if, you know, for example, if everybody thought that the journal was supposed to only be about um, really, really super high tech um, technology in that first year, um, you know, we're able to, like, you know, Chris was able to work with um, guest editors and on, on a public archaeology issue. And then all of a sudden the audience knows that, oh, public archaeology is an okay um, set of topics for this journal too. And so it's a little bit of a way to kind of feed the cloud and let you guys know um, the various kinds of, of articles that we're willing to take and diversify. And that's one way we've used um, these um, theme, theme issues is to um, help um, um, broaden what's being submitted um, to the journal. Um, so um, anyway, you can see the diversity of topics that we've published so far. So um, what is different about publishing in a digital journal? Um, there's there's um, several things. Um, the main point that I want to show you on this slide is um, how fantastic it is to be able to use full color um, in a big way in this journal. And um, I mean, I can't even imagine being able to publish this particular graphic um, in, in a, a journal that's grayscaled um, with, it, with its illustrations. Um, and, and, and I think it's one, is one reason also that, like, um, it's been very good for people working with spatial technologies. Like, there have been a number of um, LIDAR articles in the journal, things like magnetometry and these remote sensing articles that really um, rely on having, you know, kind of big images with a lot of detail. Um, and potentially a lot of color or color gradients. And, and so I think those types of articles are a, a very good fit for this um, journal um, for this reason. Another um, issue about publishing in a um, digital journal might seem like a small one, but it's that um, people are introduced to the journal through um, a digital interface. And you know, I don't know how you guys approach your publications, but when I get a um, paper journal um, in the mail, um, you know, I look at, I scan the table of contents, and then I, like, you know, start flipping through, and I, um, you know, will read the abstracts of one or another and see if I'm interested before I invest fully in, in the article. Um, in this interface that I've taken off the Cambridge Core website, all you see is the title of your article and your name. You don't see that abstract. And I think this is um, important as you think about how you're um, going to sell your paper, because um, people aren't going to see that abstract immediately. And so you want to um, be titling your papers in ways that um, gather interest. And so, um, you know, even if you're the best punster on, on earth and you want to do this really clever title, that may not be serving you particularly well if people don't fully understand it. So again, that pragmatism, <laughs> pragmatism that we associate with the journal should also be part of your considering how you um, title this. Because you want people, people are going to have to invest in taking one more click um, into your article and um, looking at your abstract. So it's not as um, that kind of passive um, um, look at, at uh, what you're doing. People are going to have to make a decision to click in and then see your abstract and then make the choice about whether they're going to download and go further. Um, so that was one of the points I wanted to make about um, the digital um, interface um, for the journal. And I think I had one more point there. Oh, um, the ability to embed and link um, various types of content. So um, this is one of the super fun things for the journal, um, I think, is you can um, embed things like 3D graphics. A number of issues have had um, these um, sort of 3D PDFs where people can do digital models and you can spin them and work, look at them at your desk. Um, so that's, um, that, that is great for showing off those kinds of technologies. Um, we have the ability to do um, videos. And so I think one of the articles in the November issue included some, um, it was a, um, talk about working collaboratively with um, children from one of the local tribes um, in Wisconsin. And there's a video of that, um, of that field effort with um, some of, with, um, anyway, the collaborating partners speaking um, and interviewing on the, on the video. Um, you can also just do sound. Another article um, just wanted to um, demonstrate the museum exhibit and how they do sound in the museum exhibit. Um, and you can, you know, hyperlink to websites and your text. Um, so, like, just think of all the, potential digital capabilities there are, and we can work with you to see if that's possible within the journal. Um, but it definitely opens up a tremendous number of ways um, to, to um, show off your work. Um, I think you can also, um, some people have suggested things like tutorials, computer tutorials, um, um, as, as another digital product for the journal. Um, let's see. So um, as we start to talk about article preparation, um, 
Um, I want to talk about preparing your paper for peer review, um, although this is also just preparing your paper for um, your ultimate readers as well. And some of the tips that will make your process go a little more smoothly. Um, so um, one of the um, key things is to establish the logic of your presentation um, right up in the introduction in the first paragraph or a couple paragraphs of the paper. Um, so one of the things that I see as I'm um, working with peer reviewers and authors is that sometimes, um, especially authors who write really beautifully, will, will um, want a more elegant start to their papers, for example. And, um, and they don't necessarily get to the point immediately. And this doesn't really serve them well, no matter how well crafted the paper is, because um, peer reviewers, <laughs> um, if you don't tell them right in that first paragraph or two paragraphs what it is you want to do, what's your point, and, um, and what it is you're hoping to accomplish in the paper, they start getting their own ideas. <laughs> and that's when you start getting um, peer reviews that, um, that um, where they start making up what they think you should do. And that doesn't help you. That's not the paper you want to write. But um, so you, you're basically being very blunt with people and being like, OK, this is what we're doing. Um, and it might wreck the elegance of your presentation, but um, it definitely helps you get through the process to be straightforward. Um, put the elegant stuff a little bit later. Um, and Similarly, um, continue to provide guideposts throughout the article. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of like that old-fashioned essay format that we all learned where, you know, pay attention to your um, topic sentences, pay attention to your headers, make sure that there's just plenty of um, information that's coming to people that says, okay, here's where you are in the argument, here's how I relate to my first point, um, and, um, you know, this is our progression. Um, so, so those might be very standard things to tell you. But um, when you um, don't go back and pay attention to those mechanics, it gets rough for your um, peer reviewers to understand where you're going. Um, so also um, sweat the details. Obviously, a well put together paper um, is going to fare better. Um, so don't have big cut and paste errors and things like that. Um, make your tables as readable as possible. Don't necessarily take the approach like, oh, this is just a draft and you know if the paper gets accepted. Um, I'll, I'll invest in that, that level of effort later um, because that lack of effort at the draft stage could affect whether your paper gets um, published. So, so invest early and then everything else goes, goes more easily. And um, for myself, I find that I don't read my own work <laughs> very well at all because um, um, my you know, brain's taking over <laughs> too much and in interpreting. So if you have a good friend um, you know, in your department or another department, um, we can help you vet your work. Um, having those critiques come before you ever submit it obviously helps. I mean, I love getting my, my harshest critiques before any editor ever sees it. And, um, and usually my, my peer review process when I'm an author goes much better that way, and I'd suggest that to you um, as well. Because we want the journal to have a wide audience with a wide range of experience and be from all over the globe, um, as our readership, um, think about your writing voice as well. Um, think about how to make it appropriate, approachable. But um, sometimes when I see people trying to write approachably, they, they write colloquially, and that doesn't. Um, there's there's a difference between those two things, and it's not something I can easily explain. I just sort of hope to point it out um, to you to think about as you write. Um, you know, see where you can um, reduce jargon. That's not possible for you know, some machinery like, you know, LIDAR and magnetometry necessarily, like you, ha you have to put in a lot of um, very particular specifications, but where you can, um, see, see how much you can ease up on, on the jargon and the article. Um, as I've said, write, write practically, write as if somebody's going to take your article and put it in their back pocket and go to the field with it. And, um, and if you don't have to say it in words, you know, we've, we've told you that the words um, limits are fairly short in this journal. See how much you can support it with um, figures and tables. Um, there are limits to how many figures and tables you can put in. I, I forget exactly if it's um, eight or nine of those combined into an um, article, but um, that guide is the style guide. Anyway, but think how much you can you can um, lose, use effective um, graphics and figures and um, and not rely solely on prose as well. And all of that helps your um, article be more um, um, more succinct and more powerful. Um, and then this is this is to go with the sweating the details. Uh, <laughs> sure, to just put this up for a really really short time. <laughs> this is the style guide. Learn to love it. It's online. You can find it all over the place. If you Google Society for American Archaeology style guide, um, you'll come up with it. This has like all the picky little details that will make um, your editors love you. Um, your tables will be right. Your headers will be right. 
Um, so anyway, I'm going to get off the slide as instructed, but um, but this is an important place to go. Um, it's about to be updated, um, and I think you'll probably be seeing that in the next two to three months, but um, but there's a style guide up there from 2014 that's pretty good um, right now. Um, so um, you've got your article written, um, and you want to um, submit it. Um, what, what makes this journal different from the other SAA journals is that we use a double-blind peer review process. Um, a typical peer review process, I think, for the other SAA journals is that your peer reviewers know who the author is, um, but the um, author doesn't know who the peer reviewers are. In this case, we're asking you to prepare your article um, for, um, in, in ways that, that decide you as the author. And um, from what I've seen as an editor in these first few months is that that does matter. Um, it's really interesting to see peer reviewers who are guessing who their authors are. They're almost always wrong. But it means that if they're guessing that, they're, they're also making some um, presumptions about who you are and your experience and things like that. You want to take that away. Don't let them presume anything. Just it's, your review is going to be on the scholarship in the article um, and the authority that you carry through your words, whether you're at the beginning of the career or, you know, you're a senior scholar. And so that's what, that's what you want. Um, and the double-blind um, peer review process, I think, helps um, with this. But it makes some parts of your file preparation a little um, more cumbersome. All right, so I'm going to um, talk to you about these sort of nuts and bolts um, types of things. So these are the types of files that we, um, that we upload into the journal. And so what this means is that you're not submitting us one, um, one file, one computer file. You're submitting us a lot of files. <laughs> Um, so we break everything up for various reasons. Um, one is the, so these are the data availability statements, the Spanish abstract, um, which um, you don't necessarily have to get translated if you have to pay for it at the beginning, but you do have to upload something that says um, a Spanish abstract is forthcoming. We can also take other languages like French and Portuguese if, if the area of the world you work in um, um, ha um, has a population where that makes better sense. Um, the manuscript body and the endnotes are single type of files, references, the variety of figures and tables. Um, the things that come after peer review, and this is because of the double blind process, is whereas other journals ask you for the title page right up front, we don't want that in your first submission. We'll get it from you later because um, this compiles all your um, contact information, your affiliations, and things that we do need to publish the article. But we don't want it um, the very first round. So after, if your if your paper has been somewhat successful in the first round and you're going forward with the article, then we'll take that from you. Similarly with the acknowledgement um, permissions, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and after peer review, these author agreement forms, that's, um, that's um, basically your copyright um, releases. Um, the type of file that this bugs people so much is, um, is that they um, can't upload their English abstract. Um, and it's because you've uploaded your abstract into the software at a um, more preliminary stage in this process. And so we have your abstract. It, it drives people nuts to upload their Spanish abstract, not their English abstract, and they keep trying to offer them to me. Um, this is um, this slide, this beautiful slide, is what our software looks like. Um, this is editorial manager software. And if you've um, done a little bit of publishing already, um, you're probably familiar with it. A bunch of journals use it, um, as well as the um, SAA. And this is, this is, I'm just um, trying to show you, if you can see my cursor, um, this is the process that you're going to go through um, as you upload um, the article. So it's going to take you down through this menu sequentially. Um, and here you can see there's where you submit the abstract, and, and um, so you can trust that I have it. Um, and this is, um, as part of your process, the SAA asks you um, a variety of um, questions that are basically the equivalent of like legal disclaimers um, that um, you know, you're not slandering anybody, you have um, the proper permission, things like that. So there's a little bit of a checklist of which this um, screen is representative. And this has recently been upgraded um, with more um, words um, from lawyers. <laughs> and um, I can't entirely understand everything instantly, but if you ask me if you have any questions, um, I'll work with you on figuring out whether the answer is um, yes or no in your um, particular case. I think usually yes is the right answer. It's meant to prompt you to think about that you've gotten all your permissions, that um, you know all your copyrights are in place if you need them, things like that. Um, all right, so I'm going to go through a series of screens to upload your articles. 
And then you're going to get to this is just a part of a screen um, for the the actual place where you um, upload uh, files um, in the menu system. So that's um, I think that's down towards the this is the attached files section of um, the, the menu. And this is part of what the interface looks like. And this is not something I expect you to um, be able to digest here in our um, session this afternoon. But um, this is why one reason I think this will be good as a reference if you want to come back to it is to see um, you upload. These are all those um, various parts of the manuscript that I showed you before, the references, all the figures and the figure captions and their permissions. This is an article in its final stage. Um, you then have a, a place where you describe them. You tell me if it's um, figure one or figure six, and just uh, some examples of our um, fire file name um, protocols. Um, these folks did a particularly good job on naming the file, so I asked their permission to show show these these dark dirty secrets of how they named files um, for the journal. And then, of course, the question that a lot of people have. Um, um, is how long will it take, especially for those of um, you who are starting to think about your um, tenure process and these various periods of review and promotion. So the part of the process that I have best control over is the beginning of it. Um, after after the first um, bits of this, then it really depends on how the article is received by the peer reviewers um, as to what happens with it in your ultimate um, your ultimate timetable for the journal. So when you upload an article, the first thing that um, happens is that the editors check it for a variety of things. Um, so you know whether you've properly um, disguised your identity, um, um, that it's complete, that it's in order. Um, um, I think that the, the that the figures look good and are readable. Um, things things like that. Um, and if if um, or actually some big things too, like like is it even an appropriate article for the journal? Um, that also is what we check at, at that initial time. If, it's, if there's anything there that's not um, um, quite right, we return it to you pretty, pretty quickly um, and ask you to do it before we send it out for, for peer review. That, that will um, be better for you <laughs> if we do it that way. And then at that same time, since I already have your abstract in hand, I'm sending it out to our um, 17 people on the editorial board and um, asking them for their ideas about peer reviewers. You suggested a couple as well, and I consider those. Um, but I'm also um, gathering from this you know, global set of people I have access to um, their, their ideas for peer reviewers as well, so that it's well beyond my own um, network. Um, and we also have various databases and <laughs> use Google to search out your peer reviewers too. Um, so we send out those peer review invitations. We allow the peer reviewers um, seven to 10 days to say um, yes or no um, to us. Um, and then, and then um, your peer review period starts, and we ask the peer reviewers to do this in about um, three weeks. Um, and so, there's, that means that um, between the invitation and the time the peer reviewers have it, a best case scenario is probably about three to four weeks that your article will be in the peer review process. There are many, many worst case scenarios um, where, like, we have trouble finding peer reviewers for some reason. Um, one thing I've noticed is that very, very particular and specialized articles have um, a harder time getting um, peer reviewers to say yes. Um, for example, we just had a paper um, by a paleobotanist um, come into the journal. And because there's um, less folks specializing in that, that means those folks are tapped a lot just to do peer reviews and they're very busy. And so it, it took us asking, you know, 16 people to get three peer reviews for that, for that article. So when it's very specialized, it might take a little bit longer um, for us to find the people with the time um, to say yes and the people whose opinions that we um, trust to give you good feedback. Um, so um, anyway, but, but you know, four, week, four weeks is ideal. And the other thing is that if a peer reviewer gets back to us and says, no, I can't make your deadline, I'm really sorry, I, I thought I could, um, can you give me another week? We say yes, it's far, far better for us to give that person a one-week extension than to start that whole one month process over again. But those are the reasons that things might remain in peer review um, a little bit longer. I guess another reason would be if you have both an accepted and a reject on your paper, or if things are really, really all over the place, we might seek some additional peer reviewers later in the process to help us figure out um, what on earth we're seeing and thinking. Um, then um, um, the, when we get all the peer reviewer comments um, back, um, I take a look at them. Usually within three to four days, I think you'll mostly get your um, letters from me on the weekends. Or, and um, and I, I go through those peer reviews and I try and, and um, tell you what I think the important points are. 
um, if the article has, for example, the peer reviewers haven't understood the article or if one of them hasn't understood the article but others have, I can say, okay, reviewer number two um, really, you know, is, is really looking for you and, and I think you should take um, a lot of their guidance and, you know, peer reviewers where you had a bad day or, you know, something like that. I mean, I'll try and vet those things to help you out and know what priorities. And I'll also remind you that a lot of people respond to peer review by adding words to their paper. That's not um, really that acceptable for this journal where papers are, are short. So I'm going to remind you that the thing you're going to do in revision is that you're going to um, think about your priorities again. So you're going to respond um, to the reviewers where you can and where you think they've been constructive. And you're also going to rethink, like, what, what are the really key points here? Um, and um, and, and do that in your revision. So um, I think the software is set up to allow you about a month for revision. This um, isn't mandatory. It's just a suggestion. It's meant to motivate you. Um, the flow of, you know, where my deadlines are depends on when you submitted your article and how, how crucial it is that you're exactly on time. But I do like it when authors um, kind of keep me in the loop. If they're not going to be um, resubmitting it within about four to six weeks, um, I'd be glad to know that, um, you know, I don't have to pay attention or worry about you. You've got it, you know, you've got a plan, but you're off to believe for a couple months or something like that um, is good to know. And then, and then um, at week 12, your article is submitted again. Um, at that point, um, it may or may not go through another, another process. So the three major sets of decisions that we make um, in peer review are whether we're going to accept the article, whether we're going to ask you to revise and resubmit it, or whether we're going to reject the article. Um, I'm going to talk first about the revise and resubmit. Um, for a lot of journals, revise and resubmit is just this horrible, you know, death decision. And I mean, it's like just barely one stage above reject, um, and you know, you feel really bad. Um, this journal doesn't really use those words that way. We do have one of those categories. <laughs> And it's called, um, I think it's called revise and resubmit for full editorial review. That, that's the, that's the like, you got a D minus, um, kind of, kind of comment. Well, it's not exactly that. It's, it's, it's that we, um, we're unsure. Some people have suggested rejecting it. Some people have suggested accepting it. And we need, we need you to redo it. And, and we'll give it, we're willing to give it another try because there's something there that's important. Um, but it hasn't, it hasn't, um, quite fared well yet. Um, otherwise, the revise and resubmit is basically like um, accept with minor revisions or accept with major revisions. Um, so it's simply saying that we're getting this paper back to you, you're going to revise it, you're going to return it, and then we're going to either have the editor look at it again, or we're going to send it out for some limited amount of peer review um, to help us assess um, whether the article is now publishable and, and um, any, any substantive worries have been addressed. So revise and resubmit isn't necessarily um, a horrible <laughs> thing to get, and it's the most common. Um, it's the most um, common decision that comes um, with a journal, um, and there's just these varying levels of that. Um, so anyway, I just don't want people to worry <laughs> about it and you know, immediately go off and get the why and I'm receiving um, an email from me. Um, accept is obviously an awesome <laughs> decision. Um, this usually comes like after you've revised and resubmitted and gone through another round of the peer review, then you might get your accept if you're um, paper needed some some revision. Um, everybody who publishes eventually gets this decision, and then at that point um, there might be a little bit more back and forth between you and me. But that's largely for things related to the style guide, um, and um, you know, be checking that your figures are uh, free with the DPI, that um, your tables are properly formatted, things like that. And then it goes on to the um, Cambridge University Press production team, and I don't have a lot of interaction um, with you at that point. Unless there's some place where you can see that I can help you out, um, it's taken over um, by our production people, and, and they're the ones who will communicate with you um, after that. And then, um, of course, we do reject papers as well. And there's a variety of reasons um, that we reject papers. Um, I talked to you, um, well, so one is the poorly presented manuscript. Um, like I said, you should select the details at the beginning. Another, of course, is unsound science. Sometimes peer reviewers will recognize something fundamental that you forgot to do at the beginning. Maybe you didn't really forget to do it, but you forgot to present that in your manuscript. That would obviously be great. And then you can, um, you know, you're always welcome to, um, to um, try and resubmit the paper. Um, problematic ethics, <laughs> if you're writing about, you know, selling artifacts from commercial shipwrecks, um, that's probably not going to, that, that's certainly not going to go over well. We've had other articles with, that bring up various interesting ethical um, points. Um, and we're definitely open to, to um, discussing ethics in the journal, but um, anyway, problematic ethics are, are another reason for rejection. 
And finally, <laughs> poor fit with the journal mission. And this one, you could have like this sort of amazing paper that is going to advance um, archaeological theory and have us talking for the next 20 years, but we're not a theory journal. So, um, so we'll reject your, your, your um, brilliant paper for that reason as well. So poor fit with journal mission. So keep in mind our journal mission. Um, there's some things that are, that are just going to be better in other journals. And us rejecting your paper is better for you um, as well because, um, because you want your article to be in line with our mission because those are our readers. So you want your articles to go to the best place where you'll find the, the most readers who can move forward with your um, ideas. Um, a generalized production schedule, just to give you a sense of what happens after um, things go to um, Cambridge Press, is that um, you can see here, so so the cover month, that means the, the month that the um, the uh, issue is, is fully published and, you know, the SAA sends out an email telling people to come take a look. Um, so for this upcoming February issue, we submitted those manuscripts in November. So you can see that in your timeline, there's a three-month lag between when the manuscripts um, go to Cambridge and when, when they're um, formally pu published. And then you can also see in here some of the other things that are um, important to you, like um, it takes about a month for you to expect to see your proof. Um, and um, and then um, shortly after you get proofs go back, they can put it online. Um, one nice thing that's happening with Cambridge, and it's not quite up yet um, because we've just started our uh, formal relationship with them, is that if you um, get your manuscript to me at some point, like say um, say your manuscript is um, ready in December, you've missed the you've missed this um, November um, timetable, but it's ready in December. I can submit it off to Cambridge, you know, right then. Um, you can get your proofs back a month later, and they now have a product called First View, where you can online publish with a DOI um, well in advance of the official cover date. So people can start citing your papers more quickly, um, which is great. And it takes away some of the um, it takes away some of the um, um, pressure towards towards um, towards our deadlines um, and allows a more continual flow of articles to come through and, and that's great for you and it's particularly great um, because like I said we have these theme issues um, in August that creates a bottleneck for some people who submitted like at this time of year um, you're just like if you submitted today you're gonna miss our February deadline um, our um, May deadline is for the theme issue. And so your paper, if you submit it today, probably can't be published until November, but we can get it online well in advance of that. Um, so this first few product is, is a fantastic um, product for, for everybody. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about quickly is um, some of the legal and ethical aspects um, of publishing, um, um, including open access um, data and the copyrights and permissions associated with um, this journal and um, pretty much all of the SAA journals. Um, one of the things that we ask, all the journals ask for is a data availability statement. And um, that sounds, you know, fairly um, mundane um, in its wording, just, you know, where's your data? Um, but we also would like to promote these data being as open as possible. So that's our mission in asking for this. And so um, I've put up this long and lengthy example that you probably can't read while I'm talking. Um, but the point of it, um, well, is, is twofold. One is that these folks um, are actually able to share their data um, because there are some concerns about um, the site locations. This is a um, LIDAR paper that had some site location information in it. Um, so they can't share their particular data, and they're telling you that. But they are giving you some resources that if you want to talk to people um, and, um, you know, and, and um, about, about data, you can do that. So, um, so that, that's important. And one other aspect of this that's important is that they're, um, that they're trying to put you in touch. They, they um, list, you know, the name of the institute that they're working with. So it's not solely limited to um, you contacting one individual. If that individual gets run over by a bus, you'll never have access to this data. They're telling you where else. Um, they're, give, they're giving you some other um, hints in here as to, um, as to who can be contacted if needed. And so um, one goal, um, when I look at these data availability statements, is to look and see um, have you put your data in some sort of institutional place where people can access it. Obviously, it's fantastic that some place like CDAR or some um, archive that has greater access, but um, but um, as long as it's in an institution, that, that's, that's a good first step. Um, the, with our with our relationship with Cambridge, we now have um, two different types of um, copyright options. One is um, what's known as green access, which is the more traditional copyright relationship. Um, and this um, is free for you. It's, it's the free standard.
third option is the one most people go with. Um, and you, when you get the author agreement, it lays out all the different parts um, uh, of what you're allowed to do with your article once it's published. For example, you can put it on your um, institutional website and in your institutional repositories, but you can't put it on a commercial website. And um, places like academia.edu and ResearchGate are considered commercial. Um, websites, even if you think of them as an archive. Um, so it specifies those kinds of things about where your published paper is allowed to go and where it isn't. It's fairly permissive. And um, the embargo period for your papers is um, 24 months long. And so then after 24 months, then you could put it on academia or wherever you want to um, put it. And that's all specified. And I've given you the, if you want more information, I've given you the web address here. Um, gold access for SAA members costs $1,000. I can't remember what it costs for um, non-SAA members. And here you get a choice of, um, I think it's two or three various um, kinds of Creative Commons license. Um, fewer people have the thousand dollars to spend on this, but some have. And um, anyway, this this makes your um, paper open access immediately. Um, the uh, digital reviews are always free access. Um, there's some publishing distinction between open access and free access that I don't understand, um, but um, anyway, those those are freely available with every issue. Um, we also ask that you get permissions for a variety of types of situations, including using recognizable people. So this, um, this particular photo is going to be in the issue you see in February. They had to go back to this guy and ask him for his permission to use this because he's recognizable. Um, if you've used um, personal communications, people's words that aren't published in any variety of ways, we ask you to get permission. This can be very informal. It can be just as simple as an email with them saying, um, um, that just says, you know, hey, I give, I give you, the author, my permission to publish um, my words, my picture in your article for the SAAs. Um, so all we have to do is have that level of documentation. Um, this <laughs> is another slide I've been told in point. And the point of it is this is the menu system you see when you get into Editorial Manager. And this stuff just tells you um, how to get a hold of us. Um, so um, it's another place to find these resources, um, these same resources. Um, this is. Um, how you get a hold of all of us. Um, and um, finally, I just wanted to um, encourage you to be part of our journal of success. So it's, it's, a, it's a journal in its um, beginning um, stages. And so we don't have a lot of, the journal doesn't have an impact factor yet. But it does have some successes that are pretty exciting. This, um, this uh, slide um, is from an article that will be coming out in the May issue. We've just accepted it for the journal. and. Um, this is a person writing about um, how to use magnetometry for land management purposes related to climate change and the, erosion, the very fast erosion of sites um, in the Arctic and the, the damage by the permafrost. So she's looking to, you know, save save Arctic sites with this article. Um, the um, special section that I told you about that was put together by um, Jeff Altschul, um about um, about um, landscape management in um, U.S. archaeology that. Um, that was read by the um, the head of the National Park Service. He read those papers. It was put together with that in mind, and he has changed the um, you know the federal guidance on how the Park Service should be doing landscape management based on those papers. That's exactly the kinds of impact that we want from your papers. It obviously helps if you have an SAA president with a ton of clout um, doing it. But those are the kinds of things that we're looking for in this journal is to be able to make that kind of difference. Um, and the very recent. Um, issue of the journal that came out in um, November on public education is part of a much, much bigger um, conversation about how do you communicate about public education, how are educators don't have a lot of ways in archaeology to um, to share their information to archaeologists, because um, we all want to do some public outreach. And so they found the journal a good place to have that conversation, even as they're having bigger and broader conversations um, through the um, Archaeological Institute of America and the SAAs and other organizations. So um, these are the kinds of impacts, like changing public education, changing landscape and heritage management, um, you know, documenting and, and helping to, um, to um, work, work in advance of climate change. These are the things that are great topics for the journal, and you can probably think of um, many, many others. Um, so I think with that, I'm, um, I'm done with my talk, and I'm going to try to figure out how to <laughs> look at the um, question and answers. And, I see that I run about 10 minutes over what I thought was going to be my 45-minute talk. Um, we, I can stay on a little bit longer for questions for those who'd like. And um, definitely um, my email address um, is back here at um, her, um, at aaphurd at desert.com. And you're, you're um, welcome to get a hold of me at any point.
and ensured and um, as well as the theater. Thank you for your time. You know, there's a lot of technical questions here, and um, if the person who asked about um, bioarchaeology in the journal, um, it, um, that's definitely an appropriate topic um, for the journal. We haven't had very much of that at all, and um, please go ahead and email me. We can talk in particular, especially if you're worried about things like figures. Um, um, and I don't see very many other questions coming up. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll hang out here for a little while and see what you say. And if there's none, then thank you for attending. <laughs> See, somebody is asking me about what about interdisciplinary approach, for example, combined between archaeology and art history. Um, I think that's that's fine. Um, it, um, I mean, we've we, give, give, it, give it a try. Um, I mean, we're, we're definitely open to it. I think that depends on, um, and you think anthropologically as you um, write the paper. Um, and. Um, um, we're, we're, we're certainly open to, to um, trying that. that. That is one of the interdisciplinary um, approaches that's relevant for certain parts of the world in particular. So yeah, give, give that a try. Um, we, we had one paper that didn't fare well, but it, was, um, it, it wasn't because it was an art history topic. It was more in the implementation of the um, study that the authors did. Um, so. Somebody is asking here about the difficulty of practicing archaeology based on gender or nationality and how to mitigate these. Would that be an appropriate topic? That's a definitely. We've had some um, inquiries about um, whether the current conversations about um, gender in, um, I think, field work um, and how it affects practice and you know the results of various um, surveys that have been conducted around the um, country. Um, if those are appropriate topics, we've said yes to that. I haven't seen those articles come in yet, but we would, we would very much like those ar articles as part of a current conversation, um, and, and we're a great place for that. And um, yes, <laughs> yes is definite. Thank you for that suggestion. <laughs> All right, well, I see some of you are still online. If you have any questions, you're, you're welcome to um, welcome to join me. 
Oh, and by the way, nobody's mic works. I think you're all muted. Only mine does. Uh, so, um, chat function or email. All right, well, well, thanks, all. I'm going to um, get offline, I think, um, but um, hopefully I've told you how to um, get a hold of me. It's um, AAC underline her um, at desert.com. And so I'm, I'm definitely happy to work with you there as part of um, that social process, process of publishing. Uh, so talk to you all later. Bye.